if any of you lacks wisdom, well, that's all of us, if any of you lacks wisdom. Think of, of young Solomon. Before, sadly, he didn't learn from experience. He got more foolish as he got older. But as a teenager, he was wise. And he asked when he became king for an understanding heart. He asked for the wisdom of Solomon, which he had for a while, before he got unstable, like a wave blown by the wind. If any of you lacks wisdom, that's the first thing he thinks we should pray for. Wisdom, holy wisdom. Not knowledge or learning or skill. These things are good, but they're not enough. Wisdom. When we see the perspective of our life, we can see the context of divine providence and all our actions within that context so we may know with a wise and understanding heart. If any of you lacks wisdom, you're not going to get it out of a book. Not even from the experience of life, though it can help. But it's the gift of wisdom to be able to see things as they really are and not as we would wish them to be or other people think they are. But to see life clearly within the context of God's providence. That we must ask from God. It's a gift holy wisdom. So if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all men generously and without reproaching, and it will be given him. How many of us ask for wisdom? We may ask for other things, but like young Solomon, what we need is an understanding heart. Lord, let me see, let me listen, Help me to be wise with holy wisdom that cannot be attained cheaply, that comes often through the trials and steadfastness and tribulations that he's spoken of. But if we ask of the Lord, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all men generously and without reproaching, and it will be given to him. We don't have to kind of fight for it. We just say, Lord, that I might see. Think of that in the gospel, how the Lord, people came, Lord, may I, that I may see. May we see. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. We're not to be like Peter, sort of measuring the wind and the waves. No, Lord, help me to see. Help me to have holy wisdom. No doubting, and I will sort of make sure I get it by kind of covering, hedging my bets here and doing all this, and I'm not sure he's going to give it, and we'll do, ah, forget all that. Life cannot be that complicated. You know, it's not like rocket science. Life is, the most important things are simple but difficult, not complicated and easy. And we need to Ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, will receive anything from the Lord. Purity of heart is to will one thing. To you, O Lord, one thing. It's when we start splitting, dividing, we become unstable because we're going off in different directions. Just like, uh, what was it, Stephen Leacock talked about a guy who ran out of the house, hopped on a horse, and went off in 10 different directions. You know, this, is, this is not what we're supposed to do. We've got to have steady, steadfast depth, simplicity. That's the way to the Lord. And that maybe that also means that we need to slow down. This constant running around and kind of bobbing around and, you know, this, this constant agitation is probably good for maybe in a laundry or something, in a the agitating, that's probably good. And agitation's probably good in, you know, cleaning clothes and maybe even drying clothes, probably agitate them around a bit. But 
agitation is not really much help in life. We need to not be like the bouncing waves above. We've got to be like the depths that are untroubled by the waves. There's one of the fathers of the church somewhere talks about a person looking down from a cliff to the, to the sea. And you can't see when the waves are going, you can't see anywhere down. But once it's still, you can see down the fish down below and everything else. So may we have a heart that is steadfast. May we ask with simple humility, Lord, may I have wisdom that I might see and do your will. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, will receive anything from the Lord. Let's offer to the Lord you know, all those unstable, bobbing up and down, agitated things that so distract us and ask our Lord to take those away that we might just be simple in his presence. And let's just ask the Lord for wisdom for the trials that each of us faces in different ways and, you know, from our circumstance, from within our minds or hearts, whatever those are. Let's just ask the Lord for wisdom to see his will and to do it faithfully. That's all. Just that. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and his beauty perishes. So will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. That's all of us. Time's up. Life goes and boom, it's over. And all kinds of things that we can pile up, whether whatever it might be, it's not so much the size of our bank account as the number of things that we can accumulate in, in our lives that, that can distract us from the holy wisdom that sees loving God and loving neighbor is what matters. And he speaks of the flower of the grass, that beautiful and just fades away. So we need to look at whatever it is in each one of us. And oh, we're all different. We all have things that are little gods to us, little treasures. My precious, my precious, it's mine. All those things, we, whatever it may be. And it could be huge amounts of wealth, and gold and jewels, or it could be one writer once said that a in a monastery, a person will sell his soul for a broken teacup. It's mine, not yours. You know? It doesn't matter the proportion. It's what can get a hook on our hearts and hold us down. And those things, whatever they may be, that where we concentrate on what and not who, can, they're all like the flowers that weather away, and so we, we've got to let them go and enjoy beauty like the flowers, but not think of that as what really matters. And so in our, our own hearts, we need to look with holy wisdom, see clearly what are the things in your life and mine, each one of us looking within. We can probably see the things that are in other people's lives that are distracting, but let's look at our own lives the things that are there that might be distractions that cause us to be people of divided hearts who do not know what is truly important, the love of God and neighbor, and realize that two seconds or 50 years or 30 days from now, we don't know when. Time's up. Flower fades. Everything's gone. And what we bring before the Lord, each one of us, 
is the humble heart. That's why the Middle Ages was very wise. They had this thing of the dance of death, which is not the cheeriest uh, thing. I've never seen that much in modern TV. I don't think uh, there are many videos of the dance of death. But it's the dance of death where rich and poor all together on their way at the end of life, where all are there all wiser and that's the gift and so that's the great reminder it focuses the mind concentrates the mind wonderfully let's just ask the lord to give us proper sense of what is important and the people we love and the way we serve and let the other things be simply like flowers to decorate the life, but no more than that. Blessed is the man who endures trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Again, he comes back to that. Rejoice in your trials, because they lead us to the crown of life, or they can, if we make use of them, rather than being ground down by them or becoming bitter because of them, our trials simply make us stronger. And the old saying, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Well, in the spiritual life, it, it's our struggles. I always like reading about, you know, these, these great saints who found religious orders and things like that. They usually end up being kicked out of the order or something like that. And they, you know, I forget all these ones that they, you know, they say, <laughs> I was just reading the lives. I try to do that every day. I got a little lives of the saints thing. And, you know, one after another, they always end up being, you know, <laughs> they, everything goes wrong. <laughs> and they, you know, people hate them and they misunderstand them or whatever. You know, even John Henry Newman, with all his great abilities and everything, he was always going through fights within the community. And, you know, he sets out to, to uh, found a university in Ireland and the whole thing kind of falls apart and the, the bishops ask him to translate the Bible and forget to tell him they decided not to have him do it and that all kind of falls apart and you know one disaster after another and out of it all comes his great book the idea of a university and out of it comes his, his letters and all the great things that lead to holiness and goodness and it may be that without those trials let's just think like I think I'm thinking of Newman when he got fired as a professor at Oxford because he was approaching things in a more profound way than they wanted, it gave him freedom to preach his beautiful sermons. Or when he, he earlier on in his life, failed the final exam at Oxford, it led him from being a sort of really bright star sparkling in his intellect to being a really profound and holy person, no less bright, but more deep. The trials did that to him, to test and to make it more real. And so sometimes our trials are kind of hard to take. It's just like, you know, the famous occasion when Winston Churchill after World War II lost the election and his wife said to him but Winston it's probably a blessing in disguise and he said it's very heavily disguised <laughs> but you know that's the way <laughs> so let's think of that blessed is the man who endures trials for when he has stood the test you know stand the test he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him because that's what matters the trials come and go but it's the loving that gets the crown of life this is just like remember in the apocalypse we were looking at that, that thing that the same but you will be given the crown of life 
The trials help us to love more, deeply, more steadily, if only we will approach them that way. So let's just think now of whatever is the number one trial in each one of our lives, things that really stress us out and, and can make us brittle and bitter. And just say, Lord, take that. There's nothing really around that can turn lead into gold. But by God's grace, we can turn trials into love. Just ask the Lord for that. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So let's not blame God. I'm being tempted. It's your fault, God. No. No. Let no one, when he is tempted, say, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Our own responsibility. We can't blame it elsewhere on God or anyone else. It's our own desires that tempt us. And that in itself is not all that bad. Because tempted by our desires, we grow strong. This is the trials that give us new life. If it's simply the temptation, which is not a sin, Tempted, being tempted by our own desires should help us to look more deeply at what we are desiring and how often it's off the track. But that's not a sin in itself. If we brush it away, grow in wisdom, grow in strength, grow in love, it helps us to grow in steadfastness. And I think God has given all of us the potential in our own frailty to grow that way. Each one of us is like a diamond with lots of cracks inside. And those either can depress us or they can be the beautiful lines along which a masterpiece is carved. It's like the big block of granite that are marble that Michelangelo took that had been chipped away by others and he carved out of its flaws the beautiful statue. So our desires that tempt us are, we've got to recognize it's my own fault. And I've got to get to, we've got to be on a first name basis with our own desires. Illusion is deadly in this area. That's why it's good to get to confession regularly because it's to help us to know ourselves. We're not telling God anything new when we confess our sins, and we're not really telling the priest anything he's going to remember or whatever, just to help him help us. It's getting it out helps us to see the geography of our hearts. And so each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. But then, the next step, Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The tempting itself can bring life, but when it brings forth that selfishness and sin, and it takes over, then it brings death. And so, it's a very great responsibility that we are engaged in, to know, to understand. This is dangerous and 
stressful at times. But we need humbly and honestly to know our own desires, whatever they may be, and offer them up in a spirit of submission to God's will and not let them take us over so it becomes sin and death. Because usually death has a mask over it. It looks nice. We've got to strip it away and see what's really there. And sin is not ever anything other than something that draws us away towards death. So may we have holy wisdom and realize the seriousness of this struggle in which we are engaged.